All right, good afternoon, everyone. Hope everybody had a good lunch and uh, had a lot of coffee and you're energized. So we'll try to keep it active today. We're gonna have some great presentations. Um, I'm gonna just talk very briefly about where we see a blockchain specifically in financial service use cases. Um, and then we'll have time for Q&A and I hope that we um, have some good questions from the audience today. Um, we're here to learn from one another. Um, and the best way to do that is to ask questions and engage with the speakers as well. And we're very excited about our speakers today. Um, my name is Daniela Barbosa. I am the executive director of the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, I also serve as general manager for blockchain and identity across the Linux Foundation. There are a few um, blockchain related projects and identity related projects at the Linux Foundation. And the Linux Foundation really thinks, you know, uh, from a digital trust perspective, that these projects are um, critical to a lot of the new infrastructure that is being built um, due to um, digital transformation initiatives, uh, specifically around things like digital currencies. Um, since 2016, the Hyperledger uh, Foundation, we used to be called the Hyperledger Project, has been the home for enterprise blockchain and blockchain-related technologies. Today, we have 13 different projects, so we are a true umbrella of blockchain and digital identity projects. Um, we have 13 different projects in different communities that are addressing uh, very specific blockchain use cases. We have distributed ledgers, we have tools, um, and we have libraries as well. Well, and these are all things that enterprises uh, can use to uh, build uh, different implementations. We're going to have IBM talk a little bit about some of the work that they see uh, specific to blockchain implementations here in Japan. And then we're going to have a JSCC, which is the Japanese Security Clearing Corporation, talk about their use cases as well. Um, here's the thing I can tell you, specifically to open source um, and decentralized technologies, if you think about blockchain as technology, uh, decentralized technology. The good news is that open source development basically has won. You know, it is essential if you're thinking about decentralized technologies that the core needs to be in open source. And I think we've done a lot of, you know, over the last eight years here at the Hyperledger Foundation, done a lot of work to educate the market, to educate financial systems and banks and central bank digital currencies with the central banks um, and uh, other organizations as well. So we're very excited about the opportunities there. So where do we see blockchain very specifically um, uh, in financial services. Uh, this is a report from earlier this year that Citibank put out around money tokens and games. And the thing is, people ask me all the time, hey, when is blockchain really going to be adopted? And if you're watching, you know, cryptocurrency, I think today Bitcoin is like up, you know, very high and everybody gets excited about it. But the core is that the distributed ledger technology and the blockchain and some of the use cases that you're going to hear today, I hate to tell you, they're boring. It's plumbing, right? This is fundamentally the plumbing into these systems, into these financial information systems that we're building. Um, and if we're building money and new digital money, um, it is you know exciting in, in the regards that it's a really important for all you know uh, uh, self-sovereign states. But ultimately, um, it is something that um, we believe um, needs to you know have a long-term strategy. It can't be overnight that it happens, um, and it needs to be done in the open with open development practices as well. Um, so this. Success of blockchain adoption really is going to just be when it's used by million, billions and billions of people. And very importantly, people are not going to know it's blockchain. And people don't care that it's blockchain. It's boring. Right, it's the boring stuff. Uh, we're not here to talk about, you know, speculative coins. Um, we're here to talk about how we're actually going to make financial infrastructure more efficient, um, financial systems more inclusive, so more people have the opportunity to participate in these systems, um, and really building, um, you know, a future infrastructure and in rails um, that support um, a digital um, uh, future that we all know that we certainly have. So very excited about the talks, uh, the speakers today. Uh, we're going to start off with um, Kai Maizakosan um, from the Japanese uh, Securities Clearing Corporation, um, and he'll be giving us an overview of the work that we that we are doing with, uh, well, that they are doing specifically with uh, some of the Linux Foundation open source projects, which includes Hyperledger. So.
So thank you, Daniela, for uh, inviting this event. So uh, how do you? Hi, uh, I'm Miyazato. I uh, work for JCC, so I guess no one knows who's JCC. So uh, JCC is a JPX group, exchange group. And the, uh, my background is uh, 12 years in Tokyo Stock Exchange and uh, 16 years in JCC. So uh, I uh, selected the three, uh, my turning point, as well as a JCC turning point. So 2009, uh, there was a Lehman crisis. So uh, after the Lehman crisis, to avoid the uh, uh, systemic risk again, the G20 global regulator uh, get together and they uh, decided a rule, global rule. So the first point was uh, 2011 to uh, fit with the global regulation. Uh, we needed to uh, start the uh, OTC uh, creating business. The OTC product was uh, really uh, bad and the Lehman crisis uh, was triggered. So uh, uh, the market infra infrastructure need to uh, supervise and manage the uh, OTC derivative. So uh, from this uh, project, the, we completely uh, stop outsourcing and uh, everything done uh, in-house development. And also, the this is uh, to uh, harmonize with the global regulation. We decided to uh, be, be uh, global the diversity. So we, uh, many nationalities and get together and the uh, multiculture or a multi-bender and shuffle and uh, decide what is the best way. So uh, that was a really uh, fast uh, turning point for me. And the second one is a risk management system. So JCC is a really concent uh, observed all risk uh, inside. So the risk system is really key for us. So uh, we, but the risk system is a bit complicated and also they spend the uh, CPU and memory. So um, we uh, start to use the cloud and open source. So this is the after 2015, we, we never use a uh, on-premise solution and also the uh, package solution, everything uh, cloud and open source. And in 2018, we started the DLT uh, initiatives, start from the data platform and afterward the uh, asset tokenization. And finally, January this year, uh, we launched the first uh, DLT production system. And uh, October, uh, we joined Hyperledger and Linux Foundation. That is a, a background. So at first, uh, what, what, who is JCC? So uh, an orange colored uh, box is a JPX group. So uh, a trading platform, the Cash equity Tokyo Stock Exchange and the listed derivative at Osaka and Tokom, it's a commodity exchange. But after Lehman crisis, we start to create the OTC derivatives. So the uh, JCC role is much wider than, than the Tokyo Stock Exchange. So uh, Japanese EM product, we need to uh, accept the all risk. And uh, so uh, we, other, other name of JCC is a, a clearing house or sometimes a central clear, central counterparty, the CCP. And also the, we are one of the uh, FMI, FMI financial market infra infrastructure. So in Japan, there's three FMIs. One is a central bank and second is us. And the third one is a central uh, security depository at the name of the JASDEC. So FMI, for FMI, the market stability is the first priority, so more than the functionality. So uh, uh, we need to uh, focus on the security or stability as a market infrastructure, but to improve and uh, uh, for more efficiency, we need to look for the uh, better solution or a new technology. That is the background. And the, uh, the last, 
yeah, we put the, uh, I put the uh, amount, it's a daily average amount a day. So uh, I'm sure the 11 trillion, trillion yen, uh, it's a really big amount. And uh, so every day, uh, GCC take the risk from the exchange and OTC market and uh, yeah, many post trade activity. That was a JCC low. And this is a uh, CCP's low. So what uh, asset flow, digital asset flow is happening? This is a, uh, this, uh, yeah, so three uh, workflow. One is a collateral deposit. So uh, CCP taking the risk. So we call the margin to the uh, sell side and buy side, and we receive the money, this huge amount of collateral in the world. So this is uh, the first one. And the second one is a cash settlement. So uh, CCP receive the uh, money from loser and distribute to the uh, winner. That is uh, also the daily uh, operation. And last one is uh, uh, easy to imagine that uh, buy stock and pay the money and receive the stock. This is a DBP settlement. So um, uh, number one and two and three, uh, number one and two and three, it's a big difference because two, we move to number two and three, we need to get the approval from all creative member firm. So both side, everybody need to join. So um, uh, with digital currency or digital security start, but all 200, 300 com banks uh, need to uh, finish the preparation. Uh, afterward, number two and three start. So um, at the moment, the JCC look focusing on the collateral deposit because one credit member firm deposit to JCC. So that's a really simple workflow. So uh, we are looking at the, like a fast business use case for the DLT space. And so uh, January, uh, we launched the first uh, DLT system. It's, but it's really a limited area. So we use a DLT for the commodity uh, product delivery process. So lava uh, commodity settlement, we use it. And now we are doing the phase two, uh, more gold and platinum silver, precious metal area. So the key concept is we selected the small, narrow as possible. That's a uh, one point. And second one is a uh, obvious benefit. So no objection from any department. That's a point. And number three is a uh, really physical delivery risk reduced under the COVID situation. And number four and five is uh, really important. And number four is uh, we should use the uh, globally standardized DLT. First phase is really limited, but we can extend the function later. So th that is number four. And number five is a uh, quick and low cost. So it took us uh, three or four months for the production launch, including the implementation and test, and the five in-house developers. So the cost is just five people and three or four months, and really limited the AWS uh, cost. That, that's it. So uh, I think the two user DLT benefit and cost, that balance is important. Uh, DLT, but cost is huge. Why we need to move to DLT? That's uh, happening. So uh, we select a really good shape and good size use case and they get bigger benefit than cost. That's a point. So flow is really simple. The bottom half is uh, as it's uh, before January. So under COVID situation, people carry the paper, the storage company issued a receipt and if people carry the 100 paper to the GCC and GCC dis distributed the other to the other side. So uh, we switch only uh, the paper part, warehouse receipt to the uh, DLT. It's, we use it the ERC 1155. Actually, this is an NFT uh, standard. But uh, we need to uh, divide into two or three because the one side and 
10 member, the other side is 20 member. So we set the uh, one token, one NFT for the minimum trading unit. So based on that, the hundred of the record, uh, the end user need to operate it. So this bulk function helped a lot. So uh, it is really a good and flexible uh, ERC. So uh, this first phase is all environment run by JCC, and we we don't allow uh, each member run the node. And also the token used only inside the JCC business through. But uh, this is a DLT solution. So once we switch on, we can you know, extend the token can be used outside or node uh, can be run by someone else. So, so this is uh, last. So this is last slide. Um, so in the middle of phase one production, this is uh, what we have done generally. But uh, behind, we are doing a lot of the POC for the more mid-term and long-term view. So uh, phase one to phase two, uh, we are now uh, lobbying activity to the uh, Ministry of Justice because uh, gold is much more legally uh, securities. So we need to password and change the law. And this is a phase two. Uh, phase two. And also the phase 1.5, uh, we are now uh, uh, enhance the each function. So uh, uh, using the AI or uh, orchestration or cybersecurity, we joined the San Francisco event and the Finos and CCC uh, crowd, uh, uh, yeah, crowd control. Uh, that is really good for us. So uh, we start, we are now reviewing this, and also the identity access management for by uh, Keycloak. So phase one is small, but step up by using the open source, and also the uh, light side is a midterm solution. So we're looking at the collateral use case as a business, and the legal discussion start, and also we touch the three. I uh, mainly use the BESU, but we only uh, uh, we use uh, Corda and the public as well, and also the connectivity, multi-cloud and multi-DLT connectivity. This is uh, really key for the interoperability for the next. So uh, uh, after the phase one launch, uh, we need to take care of the uh, uh, DLT open source. Open source is actively updated or uh, we didn't know who take care of the uh, Hyperledger BESU. So that's why did we joined the uh, Hyperledger Foundation community. And after the San Francisco trip, which it was a really good event, we uh, finally contact with other countries' FMI. So uh, uh, this month, we are discussing uh, the uh, left end end point. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Miyazato-san. And uh, uh, my name is uh, Ryu Takaki from IBM Japan. Um, I lead blockchain services business, and I've been working on this for, I think, about eight years now, so a very, very long time. So I have been here for the beginning. So. Uh, from my side, um, I would like to maybe briefly um, explain to you how the DLT or blockchain technology is being leveraged in Japan. So, so I would I would actually uh, describe not just the uh, for the banks, but uh, as whole of the industry. So, mainly in Japan, uh, we have two industry that is adopting blockchain or DLT. One is the industrial sector. The another one is obviously the financial sector, and um, I ha I'm very privileged to be working with uh, Miyazato-san for the JPX Group uh, to create the uh, Raw Futures platform. Um, at this moment, uh, the I think it's about seventy or eighty percent is more focused on the industrial sector, the supply chain. Um, in the in industrial sector in Japan, um, especially around sustainability, there is this need to be able to. Uh, get transparency throughout the whole of the supply chain of the new data, like carbon footprints, um, the uh, due diligence child data, and so on. And uh, what we're actually seeing is that um, uh, in, when in, uh, in order to 
uh, provide this pro uh, visibility to the um, industry, there is this new requirements, um, these, uh, the sovereignty piece. Uh, and let me explain. So obviously, for this kind of um, uh, tra uh, traceability piece, uh, you need to be able to trust the data. You need to be able to make sure that the uh, for example, for the carbon footprints of the uh, product you're providing, uh, the aggregate of the um, carbon footprints, including the supplier's carbon footprint emissions, is correct. So obviously you need to have the trust. You need to be able to make sure that um, it, the, uh, the information is correct. So obviously you need to provide trust. Another one is around privacy. You need to be able to trust the aggregate uh, of the carbon footprint. But at the same time, you need to make sure that um, the uh, privacy of the suppliers are met. Uh, you do not want to disclose the trade secrets of the suppliers. So these are the two. And in addition to that, what we're actually seeing, especially in the automobile sector, is around data sovereignty. The, especially the suppliers, they want to make sure that the data is they have their own, they own the data. They have the governance over their own data. So actually the data sovereignty is a key requirement that we're actually seeing, um, especially in this um, uh, one or two years. So um, beca because of these data sovereignty requirements, um, uh, it's nowadays very difficult to just say that, uh, okay, we'll create a platform uh, by using um, uh, centralized data and we'll manage it to trust us. It's very difficult. So uh, because of this um, new requirement, data sovereignty requirements, uh, we are seeing um, uh, many uh, platform providers um, trying to leverage uh, DLT or blockchain technology to basically try to make supplier more comfortable that uh, the data that they actually provide in the platform, they have the um, sovereignty over the data. So, so th that's, and, and uh, to give you a little more um, uh, specific examples, uh, we're actually providing a pharmaceutical platform uh, traceability services. Um, uh, this is basically the platform that tracks um, uh, COVID-19 vaccines. I think this has been going alive for uh, two years now. So basically in Japan's uh, vaccines, uh, we're actually using this platform to make sure that the uh, vaccines are, uh, are correctly um, uh, transported with the um, uh, temperature uh, uh, under cer certain so, so that that's the platform that assures um, the uh, vaccines. Uh, we just uh, recently released the flown gas circular economy platform. Uh, flown gas is the gas that is used in air conditioners, and uh, you, you may know that the flown gas has a much bigger impact compared to CO2 uh, in terms of um, a greenhouse effects. So obviously, um, the, uh, the industry and the government wants to make sure that flown gas is restricted. So uh, what the industry is doing is that uh, we want to make sure that flown gas is no longer, uh, we're not creating a new version of flown gas. We want to make sure that the flown gas is recycled. So what we're trying to make sure that, uh, we're trying to make sure that we can, we do not, uh, no longer create a flown gas and, of, and, and make sure that it's properly recycled. We want to make sure it's not uh, emission out and, and basically impacting the environment. So um, this is the platform that we just released. And uh, we are also uh, actually um, working on the, the battery sensitivity platform um, in partnership with the Japanese government. Uh, we're actually working with the NTT data to create the battery traceability platform and uh, working with the uh, automobile industry and uh, hope to go live by next April. So uh, quite a challenge about them. So, so um, the uh, supply chain area, so traceability piece, uh, because of this um, data sovereignty requirements, um, there's this um, a, a, a urge to basically leverage this technology to try to uh, realize this sort of requirement. And in addition to that, uh, we have the uh, uh, financial sectors uh, uh, using this technology to create a new, more efficient um, uh, settlement platform. And I think that uh, one of the platforms that we were fortunate enough to uh, be able to support is the Rubber Futures Physical Delivery Settlement Platform that uh, Miyata-san uh, is uh, providing to the uh, Japan industry. And um, I, 
and for this requirement, I just wanted to briefly touch the technologies that uh, we basically trying to leverage to um, address. So obviously, um, DLT or blockchain is a one technology that we are basically um, leveraging fully um, in order to uh, make sure that the data sovereignty is met, the, you, know, you manage all the keys and so on. And also the trust, uh, you, we try to leverage the, um, the characteristics of the um, smart contracts to make sure that the uh, for instance, the carbon footprint calculations are correct. So uh, obviously, uh, blockchain DLT technology address, addresses these kind of requirements. But uh, in addition to that, um, uh, the, especially for the clients that we're working with, it, uh, we need to make sure that um, the, uh, it's um, accountable. Um, in other words, uh, we need to make sure that um, uh, 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 are you really Toyota, are you really Honda, so on. So um, in addition to the uh, DLT technology or blockchain technologies, uh, we're basically combining the identity management, the verifiable credential, self sovereign identity piece. And in addition to that, um, the privacy piece is also important. So uh, we try to uh, basically leverage the zero knowledge proof um, technologies and combining these uh, technologies uh, together, uh, we're basically working uh, to uh, basically address the needs that I just explained in the earlier slide. So uh, blockchain, um, SSI, verifiable credential, and zero knowledge proof, uh, which actually makes uh, uh, perfectly good, makes great sense to basically work with um, Daniela because uh, Daniela works on all of these areas. So. And uh, finally, um, I just wanted to maybe introduce you to the work that we were also fortunate enough to uh, support, uh, the uh, Bank of International Settlements. Uh, they just uh, recently announced uh, the uh, project uh, Tourbillon. So it's basically uh, the work we, uh, we did to basically try to uh, preserve the privacy and in relation to privacy, security, and securability for the CBDC. So I won't go into the details, but basically um, we've um, uh, worked on uh, various um, uh, encryption technologies to try to make sure that the privacy requirements are met for the requirements that is read and needed for the CBDCs. Okay, so I think uh, that's my part. That's great, and I think we can do the chairs. We have another mic. We're gonna have you sit in there. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine, we can yeah, sit in the corner. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, I was like, oh. All right, it works out great. Um, so I think I wanna start asking a question um, very specifically about uh, two things. One, one is efficiencies to the current infrastructure. Um, what are you seeing You know, when you're trying to explain why move these systems that have been in place for a long time and use distributed ledger technologies and you know, principles like you know, self-sovereign identity, what, what, what is the gain that you're seeing? Uh, let me start. Um, so um, the reason why we use the DLT and also the open source. So um, the Japanese yen product, the actually the more than half, 70% uh, trade and position uh, outside Japan. So it means from the global buy side, sell side. Therefore, uh, our platform should be harmonized with global market. But for the last 20 years, uh, no improvement due in uh, lots of the inefficiencies. So uh, I thought the DLT is one of the uh, maybe trigger to move on the next. And the uh, point is open source is really key to uh, make the ecosystem Japan shouldn't be a Galapagos island. So uh, I, I think that we should listen to the voice from outside Japan, set aside the buy side, and uh, we should uh, choose the best way everyone uh, agreed that. That is a, a yeah. The yeah, and I, I think, you know, to, to add to that point, right, is specifically around 
Um, and you mentioned the example during COVID. So we did see a lot of use cases, obviously, with um, the um, vaccine, transportation, and even COVID credentials that IBM has done globally a lot of work with. We saw the acceleration of using these technologies because there were real use cases that needed the technology in order for us to continue being a sense. So, you know, I think, you know, pointing out those kind of use cases is, is very important as well. Um, from an innovation perspective, you know, you've been in building these technology systems for a very long time at IBM. What are the key innovations that you believe distributed ledger technology is bringing to the market? I think uh, one word, um, uh, providing a trust. Um, uh, providing trust. I think uh, what I'm, uh, from my perspective, what I'm actually seeing is that um, the platform that I described earlier, uh, there's, I think there's this um, increased need for more trust table uh, platform. So um, to address this, um, uh, especially in the automotive sector, I really find that ju just, uh, just using a traditional technology to say that uh, uh, no worries, trust me, we will manage your data for you. It does no longer work. So uh, we need um, additional kind of assurance um, to the users to make sure that um, the data can be trusted. So I think um, in order to ad uh, address this, I think um, uh, we're going to see uh, more and more platform like this with this um, enhanced trust requirements. And for that, I think uh, DLT or blockchain technology is a one technology that, that we could definitely leverage to uh, try to satisfy that requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, trust is definitely, you know, a, a long-serving uh, topic around blockchain technologies because you do need to um, build trust across markets, for example, from an international perspective. How do you go about doing that? Where in the past, with uh, physical money, it's it's a very different. So maybe we could talk a little bit about CBDCs. You mentioned some of the work that IBM is doing uh, with, uh, with uh, the BIS. Um, but central bank digital currencies, for those who do not know, uh, CBDCs, um, over the last few years, there's been a lot of implementations in production, um, in experimentations around the world. Many of them are being powered by blockchain. There are CBDCs that are not using DLT in some regions where they're experimenting, but a lot of them are using blockchain specifically um, to solve, you know, how do you create a, a digital currency um, that is uh, secure? Um, that is trusted. Um, there's a lot of legal and policy and regulatory discussions and things that need to be addressed as well, and I don't think this is the, 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 um, the, uh, the place to discuss those because that, that could take hours in discussion. But I think from a, a technology perspective, and the Hyperledger Foundation, um, many of the use cases worldwide that are either experimenting or have already in production with central bank digital currencies are using Hyperledger technologies. Hyperledger Fabric, um, Hyperledger Besu, and just this week, uh, the Solomon Islands announced a project with Hyperledger um, uh, Eroja. Um, so the key that I think you mentioned before is around kind of the standards and the interoperability. So tell us a little bit about like when you talk to your counterparts around the world. I know you, in the, you were in the United States. You got to speak to some some of the in the, the enti you know security entities in, in the United States. Tell us a little bit about how you talk ab about the technology. So uh, the interoperability is one of the uh, really uh, good keyword. Everybody uh, doing. But the uh, definition is very vague. The interoperability is many layers. So uh, not the technical part is one. So uh, uh, the multiple uh, DLT or multi-cloud or but the, uh, the public chain case, everything uh, should be solved by uh, technology. But uh, we are a market platformer. So we can add the uh, business rule idea. So. Uh, technology plus a business rule, and also legally a regulated market. That is a really a good combination. So uh, uh, recently uh, in San Francisco, uh, we talked with the uh, DTCC, it's a uh, US uh, depository. The DTCC has been within the DLT space. And uh, so th we have the really similar uh, idea. So uh, that's why the it's, it's we could start the uh, really uh, exciting discussion in the Hyperledger uh, event. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, so interoperability, one key is a cr how to make the cross-border solution. That is, uh, the sovereign is uh, one key, but on the other hand, 
how to harmonize. That's also a key point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Seth. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I think from a CBDC perspective, um, I think the um, industry realizes that um, this uh, DLT blockchain technology, um, it has the potential to basically make more efficient the settlement, especially the cross-border piece. Uh, uh, the settlement that uh, requires multiple layers in order to, um, uh, uh, to do settlement. I think uh, DLT technologies um, addresses that. But uh, I think from our perspective, it's very important that um, to basically also address the, uh, the weakness of the DLT, which is actually the privacy piece. So uh, what we're actually seeing is that um, in order to make sure that uh, we're able to uh, fully leverage the DLT, uh, we need to uh, address the privacy issues that we see in many uh, banks and uh, projects. Uh, and uh, actually one of the, um, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why the Bank of International Settlements uh, basically uh, worked on the privacy specifically um, uh, just recently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, mm -hmm. one, yeah. Sure. So uh, the, let me share the uh, recent financial market in the world. So uh, after the Lehman crisis and global regulation stricter and the CCP all over the world start to charge the margin. So if a market is become volatile, the CCP raise the margin. So the uh, user need to deposit the collateral. But uh, so in the world, generally the shortage of the collateral, that is a one point. And second point is, uh, for example, the US Treasury. So uh, buy side want to use the US Treasury deposit to JCC, but it take two time, uh, two, two days due to the uh, manual operation and really complicated um, custodians and things. So um, the collateral mobility or liquidity is really a uh, key for the financial market. So uh, I think that is a really key point, mm -hmm. the cross-border and the liquidity and the mobility for collateral. Yes. So bringing trust, bringing efficiencies, bringing interoperability. Um, I'm gonna open it up to the audience if there's questions. Norbert. Yes, that's and I'd like to ask you about ODX. So the Osaka Digital Exchange has been operating as a PTS since the middle of 22. So they're going live with digital securities on the 25th of December. And is the JSCC still clearing those? No. Uh, we, we never we, <laughs> right. So that. so So that's ultimately the next generation of settlements. So it all happens digitally and... and database so you're you're then officially the uh, dinosaur of the industry and that's why y you need to start changing as well i guess yeah it's a really a uh, good point um, so actually this clearing house the feature of clearing house is concentrate it's a really liquid market concentrate it's a benefit for all the user but the low liquid product basically one by one trade, maybe a bilateral settlement will be faster and safer. So it depends on the should concentrate on CCP or should do bilateral. That's a, yeah, it's a really key point. Any other questions? Thanks. Um, just really quickly going back to the point that you were making earlier about the privacy issues being one of the shortcomings. Can you give a more specific example of that shortcut it's a bit 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 broad and abstract if you just be a little bit more narrow yeah sure uh, so i think um, um in order to uh, i think um uh, uh, i said privacy but uh, it's not uh, very simple so obviously the reason why we're trying to use uh, dlt or blockchain technology is to make sure that um, the uh, settlement or the information is correct so but in order to do that, you need visibility. So th that's basically the fundamentals of the uh, basic blockchain. But uh, what we're trying to do is try to um, uh, keep that characteristic, but we're trying to preserve the privacy. So um, so that, that's one of the reasons why that we focus on zero knowledge proof. Uh, we're trying to uh, basically preserve the privacy, but at the same time, uh, we're trying to make sure that um, uh, the information on the settlement is correct, no double spending and so on. So um, in short, I think uh, for privacy, uh, we try to basically figure out the way to preserve privacy, but to continue to preserve the, uh, the function that the, uh, the smart contract pro provides. Any other questions? We're out of time. 
But I think, you know, I want to thank you. Um, and I, it's so important, and open source allows governments, for example, and uh, private sector to come together to work on these big issues that um, we have an opportunity to, you know, once again, create efficiencies and trust in the market um, and do it in open, openly developed, open governed communities um, like at the Linux Foundation. And uh, we highlighted some of the other projects as well that we do in Hyperledger Foundation. So I wanna thank you for sharing your use cases. We had a full day yesterday at the Hyperledger Member Summit um, where our, our members really shared a lot of the work that they've been working on. And it's just fantastic to see and that we're not sitting around talking about why blockchain, but um, how blockchain is being implemented. So I wanna thank you both for your time today. So thank you. Thank you.